Well, thank you for being here and enjoying your uh, Sunday evening of Memorial Day weekend with us. If you are, if you're here, you should know that we are in the book of Nehemiah tonight. We will be spending time, as we discussed last week, looking at what really is the chronological end of our Old Testament. And we'll be providing an overview of the book of Nehemiah, which is really volume two of what the Jews have historically looked at as the combination of Ezra and Nehemiah. And when we get to Nehemiah, Judah is the mist of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And the tribes of Israel went into exile, as you know, because of their faithlessness and their continued worship of false gods and their stiff-necked refusal to obey God's commands and live as a distinct and holy people. But the prophets picture a future regathered and reunited Israel, forgiven of their sin, worshiping Yahweh with all their hearts and all their soul, with God's law written on their heart, living under the peaceful and just rule of a descendant of Judah who would not only be a priest, but a king. And that one would be Yahweh himself, who would make an end of their sin and rule from his temple, which he himself would build. Well, in Ezra and Nehemiah, God is certainly fulfilling his promises to bring Judah back into the land, to rebuild the temple and rebuild Jerusalem. And he is also demonstrating his willingness yet again to forgive his people if they will return. But as we got to the end of Ezra, it was becoming clearer that the current return wasn't measuring up to that promised glorious return. Judah is alone without the northern tribes. Israel still encounters opposition at every turn, the opposite of peace. The temple isn't anything like the promised temple of Ezekiel, and more importantly, God's glory doesn't dwell visibly in its midst. Judah doesn't love Yahweh with all their heart and soul. And their reluctance to obey, their fear of their nations, and their continued intermarriage with unbelieving Gentiles shows that they're still susceptible to the same sins that have plagued Israel since their beginning. So as a form of review for what we covered last time, the outline is up for you, a a very high-level outline. And as you know, Ezra and Nehemiah cover more than 100 years of history including three separate groups of exiles that would return to Judah from Persia. And we see the, the kind of the four parts of that. The first two parts were belonging to the book of Ezra. The third and fourth parts belong to Nehemiah, which is chapters 1 through 7, really the third return under Nehemiah. We'll see the, the wall rebuilt. And then chapters 8 through 13 are the reforms of Ezra and Nehemiah, with Nehemiah 13 specifically being, Ezra, being Nehemiah's second governorship. So with that, I want to put the purpose of Ezra and Nehemiah up on the screen. The, the purpose of Ezra, as we looked at last week, was that God demonstrates his faithfulness to his promises by sovereignly orchestrating Judah's return to the land to rebuild the temple. And there's a couple Old Testament prophecies and parentheses there that speak to what God is doing in the book of Ezra. But in the book of Nehemiah, the purpose is God continuing to demonstrate his faithfulness to his promises. And in Nehemiah, it is by sovereignly orchestrating the rebuilding of Jerusalem in preparation of his people for their coming king. And we'll spend some time, a little bit of time, looking at Daniel 9 later this evening. But before that, we talked through last week, there's lots of dates. The chronology of Ezra and Nehemiah can be a little confusing. Ezra seems to move back and forth, leaving the chronological overview in terms of, in favor of a more topical consideration of opposition. So I want to put a broader outline of the entire book of Ezra in front of you, then Nehemiah, just to kind of get us anchored around what we covered last week in the chronology and how it fits in with the rest of our Bibles. So in Ezra 1 through 6, we saw the first return 
under Zerubbabel, uh, where the temple was rebuilt. And there we see the 538 decree of Cyrus to return and rebuild the temple, which we looked at last time actually is a fulfillment of Isaiah, as well as the fulfillment of, J- of Jeremiah. Um, we see the first wave of returns, returning exiles. We see the temple foundation is laid. Um, we later see opposition. Um, in a certain time period, we see that the temple is stopped for 16 years. The temple construction is stopped for 16 years. And then the story of Ezra kind of jumps ahead um, to the reign of Darius and kind of skips over one of the rulers of Persia, Cambyses II, son of Cyrus. So I have that in gray as a, kind of an event, a leader that's not mentioned in the book of Ezra or Nehemiah, but he is, he is an important historical figure that is, we skip over. And then when we get to 520 BC, we actually, in the middle of, of Haggai, in the middle of uh, Ezra, we actually see the ministry of Haggai and Zechariah coming alongside of Judah and encouraging them to continue the rebuilding effort. So we spent some time last week looking at Haggai and Zechariah. Finally, the temp- under their ministry, temple construction was resumed and finally completed in 516, 515 B.C., 70 years after the temple was destroyed in 586. And then between chapters 6 and 7 of Ezra, we have this 58-year gap. And Zerubbabel, Haggai, Zechariah have passed off the scene, and we find that there is intermarriage would have occurred with the nations during that time. The, the temple, recently reconstructed, was actually, actually falling into neglect And in this time period, the book of Esther actually takes place in Persia. And and Esther would be the stepmother to Artaxerxes, who is prominent in the book of Nehemiah. Next, we get to the second return under Ezra. And there we actually have Artaxerxes, if you recall, authorizing the beautification of the temple. We see the second wave of exiles return And then we have the famous scene of the dissolution of the marriages with the unbelieving Gentiles under Ezra's ministry. There's more work done on the temple. Finally, and this is what we looked at last week, this is in that section of Ezra where he jumps ahead to events outside the book of Ezra that actually would have fallen between the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in order to trace the the theme of opposition before returning to his chronological narrative. And an important event there in that, it's a little parentheses in Ezra 4, was we learned that at some point, after the rebuilding of the temple, under Ez, before Nehemiah would return, Judah actually started building the city walls, started construction on them. Well, some adversaries accused Judah of rebellion, and Artaxerxes actually orders that the work on the wall is stopped. So that's an important feature before we get to the book of Nehemiah. So with that, we now turn to Nehemiah. So if you can begin to open your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is going to start in 444 B.C., and it's going to start with the return of Nehemiah and the beginning with the remaining exiles and the beginning of his first governorship. And then we're going to see in that same time period the, the construction on the wall is begun, it's completed in 52 days, and um, I will have this full outline for you on the website in case so you have it as a reference later on. Um, but with that background, why don't we return to our original outline and we will begin our walkthrough of the book of Nehemiah. And hopefully this will be helpful. We'll start by reading chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month Kislev in the 20th year, and I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and remained from the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who remain from the captivity are in great calamity and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and 
and its gates are burned with fire. Nehemiah, outside of this one event with the rebuilding that began under Ezra of the wall and was promptly stopped, Nehemiah skips ahead about 13 or 14 years from most of the events at the end of Ezra. And Nehemiah's brother arrives with word that the wall has been broken down, the gates have been burned, and that would have been the result of the work stoppage that Artaxerxes himself actually ordered. And this news reaches reaches Nehemiah, and he is grieved, and he prays for the people in a prayer that is saturated with Scripture. His prayer in verse 5 is actually informed by Exodus 20. Let's look at verse 5 together. I said, I beseech you, O Yahweh, the God of heaven, the great and fearsome God who keeps the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Nehemiah knows that Yahweh is faithful and he will bless his people who obey him. Look at verse 7. We have worked in utter destruction against you and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the judgments which you commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah knows the depth of the people's depravity. Judah hasn't just been ambivalent towards God's commands, but in his words, have worked against God, opposing his purposes. And as his prayer continues in verse 8, praying the words of Leviticus 26, 33, remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people's. But God didn't just promise scattering. He promised his return when his people repent. And Nehemiah's hope is found in Deuteronomy 30, verses 2 through 3, which fuels his prayer in verse 9. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been banished were at the ends of the sky, I will gather them from there and I will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. Nehemiah then finishes his prayer, reflecting on the redemption of his people with language drawn from Exodus 32 and Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 9. And then he entrusts himself to God, who is sovereign over the heart of the king. Look at verse 10. They are your slaves and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand, O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your slave and the prayer of your slaves who delight to fear your name and make your slave successful today and grant him compassion before this man. And in chapter 2, with Nehemiah before Artaxerxes, the one who ordered the stoppage of work on the wall, Artaxerxes asks Nehemiah, why are you sad? And Nehemiah says in verse 2, Then I was very much afraid. And why would he be afraid? Well, because Artaxerxes is the one who ordered the work to stop, and Nehemiah is about to request this king reverse his command. Verse 3, chapter 2. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates have been consumed by fire? Well, and then the king said to me, what would you request? Orders and proclamations of a king were not to be taken lightly and usually can't even be changed by the king himself. Nehemiah is really putting his own life on the line when he requests the king to change his decree. But in God's providence, as recorded in Ezra 4.21, our exercises hadn't issued a permanent decree that work be stopped forever on the city, but he had ordered that the city not be rebuilt until a decree is issued by me. He appears to have had compassion for the Jews in not issuing a permanent decree, possibly due to the influence of growing up with his stepmother Esther and Mordecai. So at the end of verse four, we see Nehemiah in the middle of his conversation with the king tell us, So I prayed to the God of heaven. This was a quick momentary prayer of entrustment and dependence upon the Lord. And then Nehemiah begins his request before the king. Verse 5. I said to the king, 
if it is good for the king and if your servant is good before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And at the end of verse eight we read, and the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. And that's an understatement. We mentioned last week that Artaxerxes' proclamation was incredibly important in the storyline of the Bible. And to see that, open your Bibles to Daniel 9, but keep your place in Nehemiah 2 because it'll be a quick visit. In Daniel 9, Daniel reflects on the completion of Jeremiah's 70 years in the first year of Darius the Mede, who is serving as a regent over the Babylonian district under the rulership of King Cyrus. So here we have Daniel, after Cyrus is already on the throne, meaning the end of the exile is imminent, and he receives a message from the Lord recorded in Daniel 9, 24. And let's read, beginning in verse 24. Seventy weeks have been determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy of holies. So are you, you are to know and have insight that from the going out of a word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be restored and rebuilt with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Daniel prophesied of the rebuilding of Jerusalem and that when that order to rebuild was given, it would start a countdown. A countdown of 62 or 69 weeks of seven years or 483 years until Messiah would come. And you can listen to Smedley's full message from his exposition on the book of Daniel for more details. But for now, turn back to Nehemiah 2. And when reading Nehemiah in your own Bible reading, you might ask, why is the rebuilding of this wall important? We already know it's not going to last. Can I suggest at least two reasons? Number one, fulfillment of God's promise to rebuild it. God promises to rebuild the city even amidst present opposition, and he is able to keep his promises. Daniel 9.26 said it would be built even in times of distress. Well, in the book of Nehemiah, we see that distress, and we see the building. God is faithful. Reason number two, this actually serves to calibrate the people's attention on the coming of the Messiah in a way that didn't exist before. Ever since Genesis 3, God's people were looking for the coming of the one who would crush the snake. More details had been given in the subsequent prophets, and the people knew now from Zechariah's preaching that they were to be looking for the coming of Yahweh himself to dwell on his throne and fill the temple with glory. But the rebuilding of the city was a key milestone because now the coming of Messiah had a date attached. Unlike the second return of Christ, which nobody can know the time of his return except the Father, God's people could have and should have known with relative accuracy the timing of the Son of God, and some did. So after arriving in, Ezra, in Nehemiah 2 with an armed escort, Nehemiah shifts and actually conducts a stealthy inspection of the walls before he re they begin the rebuilding. And before he long, he encounters Sambalat and Tobiah who are in the surrounding areas and they lie and accuse him of rebellion against the king. And Sambalat was a Samaritan governor and Tobiah is an Ammonite official. And both are going to feature prominently in the book. But Nehemiah responds to them in chapter 2, verse 20 with courage saying, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his slaves, will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or remembrance in Jerusalem. When we get to chapter 3, work on the wall is being advanced, and they actually build the sheep gate near the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. Where are those places? Well, it's interesting to note that when Zechariah described the future city of Jerusalem, 
in Zechariah 14 with a new temple and Yahweh reigning as king over all the earth. The Tower of Hananel, that same location is actually present. This actual correspondence between the physical structures of old Jerusalem and the future Jerusalem actually serve as further evidence that Jesus' reign is not in the hearts of believers today, but will be on an actual physical earthly reign from Jerusalem that has correspondence to the present-day Jerusalem. In chapter 4, we encounter more opposition, and opposition continues under Sambala and Tobiah, just as opposition has been the norm for a hundred years since the first return from exile. And Tobiah mocks the Jews, saying that, you know, even a fox that jumps on this wall is going to make it collapse. But as the breaches of the wall are actually joined and the height of the wall begins to reach to its full height, Judah's neighbors are enraged. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 14. Then I saw their fear, and I arose and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not fear them. Remember the Lord who is great and fearsome. Don't fear the people. Fear God who is fearsome. Let's look at 15. Now it happened that when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had thwarted their counsel, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. And it happened that from that day on, half of my young men carried on the work while half of them took hold of the spears, the shields, the bows, and the breastplates. And the commanders were behind the whole house of Judah. And those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. And I don't know if you've ever built a masonry wall, but try doing so under constant threat of attack, working with only one hand because you've got a sword or a spear in the other. The opposition the Jews continued to face was substantial, yet God protected them. In chapter 5, there's a famine and a resulting dispute over a lack of food. To afford food, some Jews were mortgaging their property or selling themselves into temporary slavery to their Jewish brothers. But the wealthy Jews took advantage of the situation and were charging interest to the Jews against Mosaic law and ruling over them as slave masters. Now, Mosaic law does not forbid lending a brother money or even selling yourself into slavery. But Leviticus 25, 39 says, if a brother of yours becomes so poor with regard to you that he sells himself to you, you shall not subject him to a slave service. He shall be with you as a hired man. As if he were a foreign resident, he shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. And then he is to go free. In verse 42, they shall not be sold in a slave sale. Verse 43, you shall not have dominion over him with brutality, but you shall fear your God. However, in this case, some Jews were being sold into slavery actually because they were being extorted by their neighbors through interest during a famine. These leaders took advantage of the plight of their neighbors And Nehemiah calls them to repent, and he actually untangles this sticky situation with multiple causes in the cleanest way possible. And he orders a termination of all current obligations and a return of all property. Let's look at verse 12 of chapter um, chapter 6, chapter 5 here that we're looking at. Then they said, we will give it back and we'll require nothing from them. We'll do exactly as you were saying. So I called the priests and made them swear that they would do according to this word. Notice who Nehemiah addresses his command to, the priests. Just like the priests and officials had led the people in intermarriage in Ezra, so the priests were again leading the people and afflicting the poor. And there's repentance, but would this repentance last? In Nehemiah 5, 14, 
Nehemiah is finally officially installed as governor for 12 years. And although the governor and his family are supposed to receive a food allowance, Nehemiah actually foregoes it. Look at verse 15. But the former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. And even their young men exerted their power over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of you. Of God. Nehemiah proves to be a leader who is not ruling out a selfish ambition or love of personal gain. If only Judah had more leaders like this. Let's look at verse 19 together of verse 5, chapter 5. In closing this section of the narrative, uh, Nehemiah inserts a written prayer. And while you're reading Nehemiah, watch for these short, interjected, written prayers of Nehemiah as you read through the book. And I'll call them out when we come to them. Verse 19, remember me, O my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. If Nehemiah acted for man's praise and man's reward, he would have leveraged his position for personal gain. But instead, he trusts God to reward him for his faithfulness as God sees fit even if the people don't respond to his leadership. He knows who he truly serves, and so as he reflects on the actions he took to lead a rebellious people, he utters his prayer, God, remember me for what I have done for this people. And in chapter 6, more opposition from Sambalet and Tobiah ensues, and now they have company. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. Now it happened when it was heard by Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not yet made the doors to stand in the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Kepharim in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to do me harm. Nehemiah sees through the ruse immediately and he refuses and keeps on with the work of the wall, and this happens four times. So Sambalat writes to Nehemiah, seeking to undermine him, saying, I know you plan to rebel and set yourself up as king. Well, Nehemiah responds in verse 8 of chapter 6, Such words as you are saying have not been done, but you're devising them in your own heart. Nehemiah calls Sanballat out for his lies, and then we see another short prayer at the end of verse 19. But now, strengthen my hands. And as the work on the wall nears completion, the opposition is increasing. In verse 10, for Tobiah and Sanballat's next attempt, they hire a Jew named Shemaiah who sends for Nehemiah. Let's look to verse 10. Now I entered the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined at home. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple. For they're coming to kill you and they are coming to kill you at night. Shemaiah deceptively appears as a man speaking a warning from God. So what's the scheme? Verse 13. He was hired for this reason, that I might become afraid and act accordingly in sin so that they could give me a bad name in order that they could reproach me. The scheme is to make Nehemiah, out of fear for his life, enter the inner area of the temple where he's not allowed. If they could make Nehemiah sin in this way, they could destroy his reputation. But Nehemiah responds in verse 11, But I said... Should a man like me flee, and could one such as I go into the temple just to live? I will not go in. And then I recognized that surely God had not sent him, but he spoke his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalot had hired him. Well, in reflecting on these events, Nehemiah inserts yet another prayer in 614. But this prayer is not for God to remember him for his good, but to remember his adversaries for their judgment. Look at 614. Remember, O oh my God, Tobiah and Sambalot according to these works of theirs, and also Noadiah, the prophetess, and the rest of the prophets who are trying to make me afraid. 
Shemaiah was only one of many false prophets against Judah. But despite opposition, the work continues, and we see the wall is finished in just 52 days. How do God's enemies react to this news? Verse 16 in chapter 6, Now it happened that when all of our enemies heard of it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, their confidence fell. And they knew that it was from our God that this work had been accomplished. So here's the third reason the wall is built. God wants Judah and the nations to know that it is God who caused this wall to be built. Despite their opposition, God's purposes cannot be thwarted. In verse 17, we begin to see constant communication between the nobles of Judah and Tobiah the Ammonite. We have to ask ourselves, how did this unbelieving foreigner gain so much influence in Judah? Well, verse 18 tells us, For many in Judah were sworn by oath to him, because he was a son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Erah, and his son Jehonahan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as a wife. Israel was to live separate from the nations and especially the Ammonites. But Tobiah secured loyalty among Judah by him and his son intermarrying into Jewish families. Well, we then come to chapter 7, and significant protective measures are put into place to secure the gate and appoint guards. But even though the wall is complete, we read in chapter 7, verse 4, The city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not rebuilt. The city had not yet been repopulated, but God puts it on Nehemiah's heart to repopulate the city and rebuild its houses, and the first thing that we see Nehemiah do is he finds the original list of those who had come out from captivity under Zerubbabel 100 years earlier, and that census list will take us through the end of chapter 7. And then at the close of this section of the book, everything so far in the book of Nehemiah has really taken place across a six-month period, all in the year 444 B.C. The wall has been rebuilt, but Jerusalem is not yet populated apart from a few officials that live there. And that brings us to the beginning of chapter 8, our second section on the outline, the reforms of Ezra and Nehemiah. And Kyle did a good job of walking us through the the revival that happens here where the people respond to God's word. certainly starts off well. As chapter 8 starts, the, the people were probably weary. Sure, Nehemiah had led them courageously, but after being extorted by the priest and by the nobles, can these leaders really be trusted? But... Nehemiah was as concerned for the spiritual welfare of these Jews as he was for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And while Ezra took a back seat to Nehemiah during the city building efforts, in chapter 8, Ezra is again prominent as the focus shifts to the spiritual needs of Judah. And a little bit of background Ezra, or, or Nehemiah chapter 8 begins one week after the building of the wall. And it's actually the time, the prescribed time for the Feast of Trumpets, which, which arrives on the first, of the first of the seventh month. And Nehemiah, as governor, has prepared for the occasion with the construction of a large wooden platform from which the law can be read to the people. And Ezra is invited to read. And in Nehemiah 8.3, And he read it from before the square, which is in the front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra, with 13 men beside him, opens a Torah scroll, and the people stand and listen as he reads from the law for roughly six hours. And you thought it was a long time to stand when we read the entirety of Psalm 119 on a Sunday morning. (laughs) Well, the other 13 men may or may not have shared in the reading, but when the reading was finished, they were all explaining and giving insight, providing an understanding of the reading. 
And in verse 9, we see the people weeping over their sin at the conviction of God's word. And Nehemiah says to the people as they weep at the end of verse 10, go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. And Nehemiah calls them to turn their grief to joy. But Look at the cause of their joy in verse 12. Then all the people went away to eat, to drink, and to send portions, and to celebrate with great gladness because they understood the words which had been made known to them. The author ties true joy with a true understanding of God's word. Do you want to have true joy in the Lord? You must know and labor to understand God's word. Well, the very next day in verse 13, the people come to Ezra for insight into the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, which is outlined in Leviticus 23, and likely this would have been something that was read the day before. And in their study, they discover the law's instruction that they are to celebrate it every year on the 15th day of the seventh month, and that's only two weeks away. There's a lot of preparation to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So they get to constructing booths, and whether they left Jerusalem or they stayed there for two weeks, we don't know, but two weeks later, they're back, gathered in Jerusalem, and all the people throughout the cities are gathered to celebrate the feast, and as they obey the Lord's commands in celebrating this feast, which had not been fully obeyed since the days of Joshua, What do we see at the end of verse 17? There was exceedingly great gladness. True joy in Yahweh comes not just from understanding God's law, but understanding and submitting and obeying it. Well, this feast of booths or tabernacles goes on for seven days, and in 8.18, we see during each of these seven days, Ezra is again reading from the law in Jerusalem. So we get to chapter 9, and we see the people's response. And three days after the end of the feast, the people gather with fasting and confessing their sins. And importantly, they separate themselves from all foreigners. They read from the book of the law, and they worship God. Now, this separation from foreigners is likely a reference to marriages with Gentile idolaters that are still occurring. It had been over a decade since Ezra's last call to put away their foreign wives, and it appears maybe this is needed again. And the remainder of chapter 9 is a public recitation of the sin of the people. Perhaps Ezra prepared it for the people to read together. And it recounts the entire history of the Jewish people from creation and the Abrahamic covenant all the way to their present experience as slaves in their own land. And the Jewish history can be summarized in verse 34 of chapter 9. Take a look at verse 34. Now our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers did not do your law or pay attention to your commandment and your testimonies with which you testified against them. But they, in their own kingdom, with your abundant goodness which you gave them, with the broad and rich land which you set before them, did not serve you or turn from their evil deeds. In verse 38, after their confession of sin, the people of Judah make a new covenant with God. That is, they renew their pledge to obey the Mosaic covenant. And chapter 10 lists those who signed the covenant renewal, and when we get to 1028, to the end of the chapter, we actually see the contents of what the people pledge themselves to. And we'll just look at a few, the first few verses starting in 1028, and this is the content of what they promised. Now the rest of the people, chapter 10, verse 28, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all of those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, all those who had knowledge and understanding, 
are joining with their relatives, their nobles, and are entering into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which is given by the hand of Moses, God's servant, and to keep and to do all the commandments of Yahweh our Lord and his judgments and his statutes. And, verse 30, that we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Verse 31, as for the peoples of the lands who bring wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not receive them on the Sabbath or a holy day. And we will forego the crops the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. And finally, in verse 39, skip ahead to 39, their pledge ends, thus we will not forsake the house of our God. And this is just a great chapter to spend some time in. Well, we then come to chapter 11. And in chapter 11, after the renewal of the covenant, Nehemiah begins to deploy his plan to repopulate Jerusalem and using that earlier census as a basis for a draft of sorts, one out of every 10 families is selected to move into Jerusalem. There's also some volunteers and we also see in chapter 11, Nehemiah is really careful to ensure an adequate distribution of Levites in the cities outside of Jerusalem. For Judah to thrive spiritually, there must be priests to shepherd them and instruct them from God's law. And in the second half of chapter 12, we see the dedication of the wall. The wall had been completed, but now there's this dedication of the wall after the covenant renewal. And there's the cleansing of the priests, the people, the gates, and the wall, along with music, celebration, songs of thanksgiving, and choirs standing on top of the wall. And chapter 12 ends on a high note in Nehemiah's first governorship. And this is probably around 442 BC, probably within the first couple years of Nehemiah arriving. But there is an important transition that occurs between chapters 12 and 13. Namely, the transition to Nehemiah's second governorship. And assuming the rededication of the wall occurred relatively early in Nehemiah's governorship, chapter 13 likely starts 10 years or more after chapter 12. And unfortunately, things have deteriorated in Judah. In chapter 17, or 13, there's a challenge here. Un unraveling the chronology of 13 can be a little bit tricky, especially when there are questions about how do we even translate on that day in verse 1. But I think it will be helpful for us to explore briefly the question of chapter 13's chronology because I think it will help us understand this final written chapter of the Old Testament. So we're going to work backwards from verse 6 to verse 1. So look at chapter 13, verse 6. But during all of this time, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had gone to the king. After 12 years as governor, Nehemiah returned to King Artaxerxes in Persia, and this would have been 432 B.C. In the second half of verse 6b, he continues... After some time, however, I asked leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem. Well, we don't know how long Nehemiah was gone. It could have been several months to several years. It is his return to Jerusalem in verse 7 that begins his second governorship. So what happened during his absence? Well, for one, the preaching of Malachi probably happened during this time period. But in the current context of Nehemiah, what Nehemiah draws our attention to what occurred during this absence is we're helped out by this phrase in verse 6, but during all this time I was not in Jerusalem, which refers to the preceding events of verses 4 and 5. So let's look at verses 4 and 5 of chapter 13. Now prior to this, Eliashib, the priest who was put in charge over the chambers of the house of our God, being related to Tobiah, had prepared a large room for him where formerly they put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of grain, also new wine and oil com commanded for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. When Nehemiah was gone in Persia, Eliashib began to serve as the new high priest. And it turns out 
he was related to Tobiah the Ammonite through intermarriage. Not a good start. Eliashib actually prepares a room for Tobiah the Ammonite inside the temple. And this room was supposed to be used for storing offerings and items related to temple worship, but instead had been co-opted for Tobiah's own household goods. And in verse 7, when Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem again, it wouldn't have taken him long to discern this evil, and he responds by immediately throwing all of Tobiah's household goods out of the chamber and cleansing the temple. Well, in, so these events in 4 through Five are those, those events that happened prior to what Nehemiah was describing in his return. And in verse 4, we see another time statement, now prior to this. And what he means, this, he means that the temple desecration, which was described in verses 4 through 5, which occurred during his absence, occurred before, before another event. What event did it occur before? The events of verses 1 through 3. So let's look at verses 1 through 3. And on that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. Because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So when they heard the law, they separated all foreigners from Israel. Bringing Tobiah, an Ammonite, into the temple was a clear violation of Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 through 5, which is quoted there. And the people read this command in Deuteronomy, and they respond to God's word. And since the people's repentance at the hearing of the law and the expulsion of Tobiah from the temple both occur after Nehemiah's absence. It appears these two events are linked. So kind of a summary of the challenging chronology right there. But putting these together, what happens? Nehemiah returns. He sees the desecration of the temple. He expels Tobiah, cleanses the temple, and brings the law of Moses to bear on the people, possibly through Ezra's participation in reading of the law. And the people repent. And the people expel the rest of the Ammonites and Moabites from their midst. But it's alarming how quickly Judah fell into such sin already. But thankfully, the result is repentance. But soon later, in verses 10 through 14, Nehemiah learns that also while he was gone, the people stopped paying tithes to the Levites. So the Levites and the singers left the temple to work in their own fields. No wonder the storage room in the temple, which was used to hold the contributions for them, was available for use because it was empty because the people weren't giving. And so it was available for Tobiah's use. And in verse 11 we read, Nehemiah says, So I contended against the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? It's empty. And then I gathered them together and I had them stand in their post. And Nehemiah chastises the leaders and accuses them of forsaking the house of Yahweh. Recall the language of the people's renewal in Nehemiah 10.39. Remember at the end of their promise, they say, for the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the chambers. The utensils of the sanctuary are there, as well as the priests who are administering and the gatekeepers and the singers. We're, we're going to bring the contribution. Thus, we will not forsake the house of Yahweh our God. And Nehemiah says, you didn't do any of what you pledged, and you have forsaken the, the house of Yahweh your God. Every word of this pledge has been forsaken. They had forsaken their tithes. They had forsaken the house of God. They had broken their renewed covenant pledge. So Nehemiah reinstitutes some faithful men over the storehouses. And at the end of verse 14, we again see one of Nehemiah's familiar prayers of remembrance. Verse 14. Remember me for this, O oh my God, and do not blot out my loving kindnesses, which I have shown for the house of my God and its responsibilities. 
It's as if Nehemiah is saying, God, I've done what I can do. I've sought to be faithful and lead the people, but whatever I do, the people are unfaithful. Please don't charge their faithlessness to my account. Remember me, God, for how I have served you. One verse 14, there's more trouble among the people. They pledged to keep the Sabbath and not purchase from the Gentiles, selling their wares on the Sabbath, if you recall. But now Nehemiah looks, and he sees them not only working, but also purchasing from the men of Tyre on the Sabbath. And look at verse 17. So I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil thing you are doing, even profaning the Sabbath? Did your fathers not do the same? So our God brought on us and on this city all of this calamity. Hey, you are adding to his anger on, on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And notice Nehemiah here records no indication of the presence of repentance. But rather, he actually must physically shut the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath to keep the merchants out. The people weren't helping him. And again, this episode closes with another prayer of remembrance by Nehemiah, verse 22, chapter 13. For this also, remember me, O my God, and have compassion on me according to the greatness of your loving kindness. But there is one final sad episode to go. But surely, if there is one lesson that people had learned throughout their history, it was the devastating consequences of intermarriage and unbelieving with unbelieving Gentiles. Surely they've learned this lesson by now. And look at verse 23. In those days, I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Remember, these people were just expelled at the beginning of chapter 13. This was a rapid return to disobedience. Look at verse 24. As for their children, half spoken the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judea, but only the tongue of his own people. Judah is so deep in its sin that their children couldn't even speak Hebrew, meaning they couldn't read or listen to God's word. How would this next generation obey the law of Moses when they couldn't even listen to it being read? 1 verse 28, Nehemiah expels even the high priest's grandson for marrying the daughter of Sambalot. In verse 29, we get another Nehemiah prayer. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. And this might appear at first glance to be a prayer for God's mercy for those who defiled the priesthood, but this is actually more in line with his prayer in Nehemiah 6.14 when he says, Remember, O oh my God, Tobiah and Sambalot according to these works of theirs. So when he prays in verse 29, he is praying for God to hold the people accountable for their sin. Judah continues to run after the nations. Despite Ezra and Nehemiah's faithfulness, the people, and especially the priests and the nobles, continue to forsake the Lord, and every act of repentance is at best short-lived. Now, there's to be sure a faithful remnant who genuinely repented, but the people as a whole continued in disobedience. So we come to verse 30. Thus, I cleansed them from everything foreign and ensured that the responsibility stood for the priests and the Levites, each in his work, and I arranged for the supply of wood at fixed times and for the first fruits. And Nehemiah knows what is needed to bring Judah to repentance. And he is aware that despite everything he did, the people remain unfaithful. Nehemiah has been a faithful governor, but the people need their king. When all of his faithful efforts appear to have been in vain, Nehemiah can only trust in Yahweh, and he ends with one final prayer. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. As Nehemiah re reflects upon these events in his ministry, He's just overcome over time after time with just, just a dependence and trust in the Lord. God, remember me. Well, how would the first readers of this book respond to this closing? Would they recognize the dangers of sin? Would they finally heed the words 
of the prophets would they finally return and love Yahweh with all their heart, right? The city has been rebuilt and the king is coming. Would they be ready when he actually arrived? Or would they still be taking advantage of the poor in, the, in their myth for their own profit? The ending of Nehemiah shows the utter failure of the Levitical priesthood and the officials and nobles of Judah to shepherd its people. Everywhere that the priest should have led the people in holiness, they instead led the people in disobedience. Israel's shepherds had failed them. But in these final pages of the Old Testament, God set the event in motion that will lead to the coming of, the coming of their king. For the faithful remnant, anticipation of the arrival of the Messiah should be growing. Should be growing right? When the curtains draw to a close on Nehemiah, Two of Daniel's 69 weeks have already been completed. 67 more to go until the king arrives. But we know how this story ends. When their king arrived, the people rejected him. But God used their rejection of him to bring about his eternal purposes. As the Jews called for the death of the Son of God, God was carrying out his eternal purposes amidst opposition to accomplish what he desire to crush his son and to have him take on the penalty of sin for all who would put their faith in this king. But God still had not forsaken his promises to restore his people. Israel would not be ready for the Messiah when he first came. But God will prepare Israel to receive him once and when, as Zechariah 12, 10, 10 states, when he pours out on them his spirit and they look on him whom they have pierced and mourn in genuine repentance. Some lessons from Nehemiah, and there are a lot of lessons, and my prayer is that you just picked up just a few of them that you have a desire to return to and further flesh out. But here is a, a couple message, messages that we can take from Nehemiah. There are messages about courage and leadership and handling opposition. Nehemiah also serves as an example of not living for selfish ambition or sordid gain, but for God's glory and the benefit of others. There are also lessons on prayer, conviction of sin, through God's word, confession, true repentance. In Nehemiah, we see that God is holy, but he is also kind and gracious to forgive his people when they return to him time after time again. And we also know that God is sovereign over all of history, including the heart of a king. The Jews were not ready for their king when he arrived, but he did come, and he is coming again. Do you know him? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for these words, and we thank you for the way that you work through history. Lord, your purposes cannot be thwarted. You are sovereign, you are good, you are holy, and yet you forgive those who turn to you. Lord, we thank you that we who are here today are beneficiaries of you extending the promises to your people Israel, which you will one day fulfill to outsiders like us. And you gave us hearts to believe. Lord, we, we pray for and we long for your son's return and for him to set up his glorious kingdom. Lord, may we live in light of your king's return. In your name we pray, amen.